Okay, uh, we're going to get started now with uh, Mr. Richard Dolan, who I've known for a number of years, who is actually the publisher of the uh, book that I've just released, UFOs, Area 51 and Government Informants. I, my first encounter, I should maybe tell the story, my first encounter, I was at uh, the Center for UFO Studies. I had run across Richard Dolan's book. Richard doesn't even know the story. I had this book, and I was at the Center for UFO Studies, and I said, have you seen this new book, man? I'm in the, I'm in the uh, index of his book, and I'm looking at all the presidents. He's got this president's story, this president. I'm going, man, this is the most amazing thing. He said, no, this is terrible. You know, like, what's this guy? You new, new guy. I'm, and they had no interest in this book whatsoever. And now he's one of the main historians, the main guys who everybody looks up to to get the information. But when he first started, I remember the reaction. It was like, get out of here with this stupid book. I mean, and I thought, you know, you've got to read this book. It's really good. So anyway, uh, here's Richard. And uh, I, I'm honored to uh, be... Uh, a friend of his, and to be able to introduce him this evening. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Wow, I'd never heard that story, Grant. They still don't like me, so it's all, it's all, uh, it's all good. Yeah, I get, I get love from certain portions of this research community, and no love from a few select portions, and that, that is one of them. Uh, well, look, you know, the uh, if you really want to go through life without um, you know, having anyone say any bad things about you, then here's my advice. Don't, don't do anything, don't aspire to anything, and don't be anything. Mm -hmm. And then no one will criticize you. Um, so we had a little bit of a computer snafu early, but everything, everything's good. Um, so I think we'll be fine. So I'll just be signaling for you to, to advance the slide, just the arrow key, that should do it. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I'm supposed to go till 6 a.m. I believe that was the word that was put out earlier. So if you've got some coffee, we'll be there. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, won't, it won't be that late. It, it might, I might take a slight liberty with the 50-minute uh, idea. I might, I might go like a little longer. If it goes too long, you can delete. I wouldn't blame you. Uh, so I thought I wanted to do a disclosure type of theme for this, for this lecture. Um, I mean, that's what this is about, citizen hearing for disclosure. And uh, as some of you know, I've, I do write history, but I, I've also tried for many years to be as creative a thinker in this field as I can be. And uh, that means looking at this in as fresh a way as I can, asking original questions. And one of those questions a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, not will we have disclosure, will there, will there be an end to the truth embargo, but if it happens, what, what next? How will it actually change our world? Because what I'd noticed for years is that people love to talk about disclosure. And, uh, you know, basically it, it was either either nothing, like no vision as to what it would be like, or some kind of utopia where we make the deserts bloom and all problems in the world end. And I just thought somehow that there's got to be more to it than that. So that I actually co-authored a book a couple of years ago about this called AD, After Disclosure, get it? Uh, and it was uh, sort of our grounded speculation on what the world would be like. I'll talk a little bit about that and a lot of other things. So could you hit the slide, please? I want to go back in time a little bit uh, and because I don't think really think we can truly appreciate disclosure until we understand the depths of the secrecy itself. Grant Cameron did a fantastic job in his last lecture in talking a lot about the cover-up and the lies and the depths of those lies. I'm going to be covering a little bit of that myself maybe in, in my own way. But, you know, so let's go back to uh, the, the post-World War II era and I don't want to go through the whole argument about why UFOs are real. I'm not really interested in doing that here in this conference. I think we're all on that page. So let's assume something like Roswell happened. There was a crash. There was a recovery of some kind of exotic technology that was not manufactured by our civilization. Um, in the words of, uh, of, of what came to me, actually, through a, um, a very, very, very high-level uh, scientist connected with the intelligence community, um, he had heard that one of the key words used was not made by human hands, technology not made by human hands. So let's just say that happened. So you are, um, you might be the president, Harry Truman, there's a secretary of defense, James Forrestal, who ended his life with a 16 floor bungee jump out of, sorry, that didn't sound nice, out of the Bethesda Naval Hospital. Uh, he was certainly murdered, not suicide. To this day, the official conclusion, it was a suicide. It's not true. So just look, go back there and let's, let's look at that situation. Next slide, please. 
So you've got this uh, artifact, these artifacts, this technology that's from somewhere else. It's incomprehensible. Um, hit the next button there. So this, was, this is a clip from, uh, you know, the end of World War II. Uh, homeless people, millions, millions of people who did not have a home, millions on the brink of starvation. Next slide, please. Uh, we have the atomic bomb that had just been detonated. It created a completely new world, right? Next slide. And, uh, and right, the birth of the Cold War. So all of these things, it was a world that, yes, there was a great sigh of relief that the Germans, the Nazis had been defeated, the Japanese Empire had been defeated, but now we have all of these new problems, these new issues. And you've got this new thing now on your plate, this, these objects, these flying saucers, these maybe alien beings with incredible technology. Do you, do you decide to tell the world about it? Next slide, please. You have another problem. You have the problem of oil. Look, the thing is, even a 10-year-old child can tell by looking at one of these flying saucers that they're not using gasoline uh, to go around the block. They're using something better, whatever that better is, whether now we talk about zero-point energy or maybe nuclear fusion. Um, there's maybe other, other even very exotic things out there. Um, but whatever those things are, implicit in their energy solution is something that does not have to do with petroleum. And, and, and that's a bad thing in 1947, because petroleum was the boom industry of the world. Next, hit, hit a couple in a row there. These are just pictures of the oil industry. Keep going. Uh, there were lots of jobs. Keep going. And, uh, and one more. And that leads to the car industry, because it's the way it is today. Every single thing is dependent on petroleum. If we were to get off of oil, let's say there is a free energy solution to all of this, which there very well may be. Um, there's a lot of jobs tied up in the oil industry. Back, back in the 50s, it was uh, generating 5%, 10% growth every year in that industry alone. It was the engine for world, the world economy, the automotive en en uh, industry as well. Next, please. And then you've got these. Hit another one. Um, and again, a couple more. Just keep going. Okay, so implicit here is something radically different. So next. And then you've got the whole idea of social control. Um, maybe the people in this room, if there was a disclosure announcement, might not panic. You might take it kind of calmly. I bet not all of us would, even, even all of us who've probably been thinking about this a lot. I don't know how calm I would be, to be honest with you. Um, and then, you know, you've got family, you've got relatives. I've got relatives. I can tell you for sure not all of them would be very good with this information. Do people kind of lose it when the going gets tough? Yes, many people do. And you, we really have no idea how bad panic might be. Next. Uh, and here's a statement. This is from Air Force Captain Edward Ruppelt back in the early 50s when he was running Project Blue Book. He was talking to uh, U.S. Marine Corps Major Donald Kehoe, who was one of the early researchers on all of this. And Ruppelt said, how could we convince the public the aliens weren't hostile when we didn't know it ourselves? So all of these reasons, now you're Harry Truman and you've got this information. Do you really tell the world about this awesome reality until you get some information about it yourself? You, you really can't. Because if you give up the tech, if you tell them you've got this technology, then, then it becomes very difficult not to share it with the rest of the world, in particular with the Soviet Union, which you don't want to do. You didn't want to share atomic technology in 1947. You're certainly not going to want to share something as nifty as alien technology. Next. And there's just too many unanswered questions at that point. So, uh, and then, on, then you got nonstop military encounters. Even by the late 1940s, this was already happening. Um, Aircraft, uh, fi fighter pilots, and other military personnel, not just ordinary civilians, were encountering UFOs. We have um, memos dealing with this as early as 19, well, there's the Foo Fighters from World War II, which uh, certainly were part of the picture. And we have a memo from Air Force General Nathan Twining, who became a four-star general, this is a very famous, I'm sure many of you know, in which he describes, uh, in response to a letter by another general, 
who basically wanted to know, is there anything we need to do about these UFO, these flying saucers? Is this something that we're making? Twining essentially says no, and then describes point by point a number of the key characteristics of these saucers. Uh, silent, evasive upon sighted, um, great acceleration and speeds. And then, of course, uh, my favorite line is, he says, typically domed on, t uh, round on top and flat on bottom. And ask yourself, what in 1947 would have that type of a shape? Next, please. Uh, yeah, I wrote an article a few years ago, which I think is a useful, if anyone's really a skeptic who wants to have a pretty good argument, on why this is taken seriously, I, I would encourage you to go to my website at keyholepublishing.com. This is an article I wrote, 12 Government Documents That Take UFOs Seriously. Uh, I've got uh, JPEG images of the documents themselves, plus my own analysis of them. And uh, it's a good, short kind of, I think, 3,000 word piece. You can get through it pretty quickly. And uh, I, th I think it gives a very good presentation as to some of the, the good evidence in terms of declassified literature that uh, I think an intelligence skeptic would want to go to. Next. And again, please. So with all of that going on, I think it's easy to see why you'd need secrecy, right? Uh, you, you couldn't just tell the world right away. Now, if you had the best intentions, you might get your people together and say, all right, let's figure out our game plan. We will... Uh, Consider telling the world, maybe in a couple of years, at some point, but we need information. So, but now you've got this, these artifacts to study, and that's gonna be expensive. So how do you pay for that? Well, you can't really just tell Congress, uh, we, want, we want some money set aside to study this ET uh, technology, so you have to hide it, so you have to create a black budget. Uh, I have, I've argued for years that students of the black budget and I don't even know how many of them there are in our university system anyway, but I don't really think they have uh, any true appreciation of just how important the UFO phenomenon is in the history of black budget America. I, th I believe that it's a, not the only component, obviously, at the beginning, but I think it's an important component at the beginning. You have to go black, as it were, if you're going to study this quietly right from the beginning. It's expensive. Uh, one, uh, again, one particular, I hate to uh, talk about like secret sources that I have, but uh, one particular uh, individual I have who has a, a good deal of um, experience with this just said to me as a way of insight, it's very expensive, this type of program to study this technology, but he said the security is actually more expensive by a factor of seven or eight over the scientific R&D. In other words, and he didn't, go into details about security, but I assume it's more than just guys with guns. Uh, there's gotta be a built infrastructure, maybe underground. There's gotta be money as well to manage the public, to manage academic world, media, political world. I think a lot of, a lot of um, money passes through the system to keep everything nice and quiet and contained. And you have layers of secrecy. Uh, so if, um, if you're part of the ET program, let's just say, th that's a program that would be nested within other programs. So you might leave house, say goodbye to your spouse, and you go to work and you check in, and uh, let's say it's with the Navy. But then through the Navy, you're, you've been recruited into another black program, so you check into that one. But then through that black program, then maybe you're in something related to this. So it's layers and layers. And, and uh, this is, again, something that's been studied and commented on, and this is in the um, academic literature to some extent. So you have to have control. You need to control your mainstream media, the radio newspapers. And we know that this has all been done through, um, in other areas. Um, CIA's had very close relationships for years and years with all major media. Famously, uh, what was it, CIA director? I think it was, um, was it not Helms? It was um, Colby, I believe, the one who drowned in the Potomac River. Remember that? About 15 years ago. Who said, uh, we can, you know, all, made, all media is really under our thumb. We've got them all. 
You have to control the academic and scientific community. It's really not as hard as people would say. I think the academic community has a very, very unrealistic notion sometimes, at least I get the idea of, of how independent it really is. Everything's dependent on grant money, first of all. So you've got to do that. And everything's dependent on getting tenure. Um, I mean, hell, when I was uh, living that dream, thinking I wanted to teach in the university, you couldn't even talk about the JFK assassination in a truly open, candid way. I mean, something that prosaic, relatively speaking. UFOs, it's impossible. But I think that the way that it works is that uh, you have a few guard dogs, as it were, placed in the, in the system. Uh, back in the 1950s, one of the top ones was Donald Menzel, Harvard astronomer. You know, who, who's going to mug Donald Menzel in the academic world? The answer is nobody. So Menzel was the world's leading debunker of UFOs. And it uh, turns out he was very high level with NSA, a, a thing he bragged to uh, President-elect John F. Kennedy about uh, trying to ingratiate himself with Kennedy when he got elected. Uh, no one knew about Menzel's connection to the NSA, not even his wife, apparently. Uh, Stanton Friedman found it uh, when he was going through uh, the Menzel archives at Harvard University. Uh, th the point is, n none of this proves that Menzel was working for the man, as it were, but I mean, it, everything lines up. He had the connections to the highest level classified world, and here he is writing the most ridiculously bad, uh, I mean, really, truly intellectually insulting debunkings of UFO phenomenon, utterly unworthy of a man of his intellectual stature. But So the point is, if some community college professor got interested in UFOs, there's Donald Menzel to smack him down. And I think this works within the media. It works within all, all established disciplines where most people are not going to be heroes. They're not going to be Superman. They'll just go out and they want to do their job, and they don't want to make the waves anyway. And they don't really have the stomach or the um, ability to fight certain battles. We all know this. And then the other reason you need secrecy is you, you've got to have, uh, you need a way to study this technology and all of the implications of what you're dealing with. And you can't do that with everyone looking over your shoulder. I mean, realistically. I can understand their situation. I mean, I, I'm not on their side, but I can understand why they would feel a need to hide all of what they do from the rest of us. Next slide, please. So I often think of secrecy as a big iceberg where all the action, most of the action is below the water. In terms of the information we have been able to get from our government on UFOs, or really probably a lot of things, uh, most of the stuff that we have is just above the water. So you have public open sources at the top, then you have sources that were once classified but are now declassified, so they're available for you. Uh, then you have at the level is, is a, a, a classification called unclassified, which they're technically legal for you to get, but they're really hard to find, and you've got to be very, very good at, at uh, obtaining them. And then you've got below the water, there's different levels. There's confidential and secret, then top secret, and then you've got a variety of compartmented types of uh, top secret SCI and you got, and a lot of these are kind of mixed together because a lot of them would be within special access programs and unacknowledged special access programs which don't exist except that they do exist and waived which means that they're waived from any kind of oversight and so on. And then you go down to the private contractors and clicks and what you find is that uh, most of the black budget special access programs or at least many of them seem to be dominated as far as we can tell by private contractors much more than uh, DOD personnel. And then at the bottom of the iceberg would be them, whoever they happen to be, these other beings. Let's not forget them. They're certainly not announcing themselves openly to us. Next slide, please. Uh, 